In part one, we saw how a groundbreaking law had created a vibrant market in the USA for investing in wetlands restoration. But can the same concept work at an international level with thin air? Like the market in wetlands, this is a market created by regulation. In Kyoto in 1997, the members of the European Union and Japan signed an agreement that commits them to reducing their greenhouse gas emissions by around 5% below their 1990 levels. Instead of just enforcing stringent cuts on industry, the government created a market as a relatively painless way to help the big polluters to reduce their emissions. This is a market where, unlike a market for food or clothing or shelter, uh, there's no natural demand for this market. This entire market is created by policy. So how does a market in carbon get created? Basically, any industry that emits a certain number of tons of greenhouse gases, less than its limit or cap, earns what are called carbon credits. It can then sell these credits on the open market to companies which can't or won't meet their emissions limits. As was intended, carbon trading sprung up to make money out of this. Look, she's she's desperately looking for someone she has to close a deal. From fund managers to renewal energy companies, lawyers and bankers, and they're all here wheeling and dealing. You might want to find the right professional service advisor, a lawyer, an accountant, a banker, somebody who's going to make it more likely that you will have a successful uh, investment strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. At the Carbon Expo Fair, renewable energy companies are trying to sell their carbon credits or the technology to produce them. GE Energy and our client project developers are working on emissions reduction technology projects around the world. They're helping us to capture otherwise vented or flared gases through either coal mine methane, landfill gas or biogas opportunities. Fund managers and banks are on the prowl, buying credits and looking for the next emission reducing projects to invest in for their clients. They look at carbon as, as a different commodity that they would be trading, such as oil, gas, coal. We work for more than 50% of uh, the 500 FTSE biggest uh, companies in the world and they are in this market. Developing countries who've signed the Kyoto Protocol do not have to limit their emissions. But if an industry in a developing country can show it's reduced its emissions, it too can earn carbon credits. Industries in developed countries snap up these credits, as it's often cheaper to reduce carbon emissions in a developing country than to cut back their own emissions at home. In our country we are not uh, uh, emitting very, uh, so much of this kind of uh, greenhouse gases but uh, we can contribute to the global market uh, by uh, investing into uh, some projects. What we're trying to do is get the information out there for potential sellers and buyers that want to invest in Colombian projects. We want to show that South Africa is ready. We want to en encourage investors to come and invest in South Africa. The traders may all be here chasing profits, but there's also the feel-good factor for them. They believe they are doing their bit to fend off climate change. Last year, the market traded over 3 billion tonnes of reductions in CO2. Trust me, this is why everybody's here, and it's not about making money, it's about making uh, the world in, in which we live a, a better place to be in the future. But there are widely differing views on how effective trading is in meeting Kyoto targets. And the EU admits that the original emissions allowances given to many industries were far too lax. And some NGOs claim carbon trading is just a way of appearing to take action, while not making the stringent cuts scientists say we need to curb global warming. It's kind of pretending that we can keep on with these kind of carbon intensive business practices and, and, and production. At some point we have to kind of get back to the reality of the situation, that we can't keep on consuming fossil fuels at the rate we are doing. And emissions trading is just providing an elaborate justification for that. And at the Cologne Carbon Expo, frantic discussions are taking place about whether the carbon market has a future at all. So there's this uh, nervous energy that I'm sensing in the room this year that I didn't, uh, you know, I feel last year. Last year I felt there was a gusto and it was all very gung-ho. 
That's because the Kyoto Protocol expires in 2012, and governments are now negotiating what mechanism will replace it. But markets don't like uncertainty, so this leaves billions of dollars in limbo until the new regulations are decided. And the carbon credit industry, created by governments, is now lobbying its makers. It is critical for the market that those negotiations over the next two years um, provide certainty and provide a positive signal for the market going forward. There is no reason whatsoever to think now that suddenly in 2012 you should stop it. That, that would be very silly. But despite their fears, the carbon trading industry is still forecast by the World Bank to double next year. And soon it could be more than just carbon trading and mitigation banking that are raking in the cash. Investors invest to make a profit. In the case of wetlands or greenhouse gases, governments have brought in regulations to create a market and help generate profits to benefit the environment. But would bankers ever invest in nature without government incentives? Some say that as human beings continue to overstretch ecosystems, they will increase in value for business. These functions that have been delivering benefits for us for millennia that we've taken for granted and not paid for are now things that we need to pay for. And as their um, scarcity is felt by companies amongst others, they'll start to pay for them. Global insurance companies, not known for their risk-taking investment strategies, are starting to insure nature itself. Allianz is in the business of insuring things of value and ecosystems definitely have value. And in in fact, today we have an environmental liability product that ensures against pollution liability related to watersheds. Uh, I could also envision as ecosystems are used to produce products that these would be insured as well. Over 250 of the world's biggest companies with $14 trillion in assets have signed up to a UN initiative to develop their businesses sustainably. And one of the key components of this is to protect the natural resources their businesses rely on. The services that nature provides to us is just as important as the, I suppose, safeguarding the, the way we manage our impacts to the environment. And I think that that, that, that dynamic is, is, um, is critical. But for the moment, direct investment in nature's services is minuscule compared to the global economy. For example, according to the Katoomba Group, the fledgling market to invest in watersheds is only worth around $40 million a year. Some of the biggest investment banks blame this on lack of action from governments. They say they need international agreements similar to the Kyoto Protocol to create a market for ecosystems. Without rules, we can't invest. These are huge investments that pay back over a very long period. So we need to know going in year zero that in year five or 10 or 20, the system is going to have, you know, the regulatory system will have evolved to the point where it will be economically necessary for our innovative new product to exist. If we leave things as they are and we leave this purely to the sort of to the free market to figure out its solutions, it's not going to happen. There are signs of change. The German government has sponsored a report on the economic value of ecosystems. Its initial findings were presented at the UN's Biodiversity Convention. The report, called the Economics and Ecosystems of Biodiversity, is designed to be the first step to finding an international standard for putting an economic value on nature's resources. I believe that we have to achieve the maintenance and sustainable use of nature, so we gain at least one euro more in the preservation of nature as in its destruction. We want the treasure that we have on this planet to gain interest like in a bank and not diminish. But some say the best way to encourage investment in nature is to change our definition of what we mean by the economy. The economy really, it really includes everything that contributes to human well-being. And natural capital is as much a part of the economy as, you know, as factories are. We need to think of the whole system uh, as, um, as our economy, if you will. The real economy really is the whole earth. So who are the people with a vision to keep nature in working order? In each episode of Nature Inc, the end note goes to the visionaries. This week we hear from one of the world's leading economists.
The essence of an ecosystem is that its performance depends on preserving its region-wide services, but each farmer individually, each business operating individually may say, well, we're going to do what we're going to do when the ecosystem, someone else should take care of that. But then you add up all the individual actions, and of course you get the tragedy of the commons, that no one has looked after the common good. So the problem is designing the rules and the regulations and the incentives so that individual behavior produces a socially desirable result.